coming up. This is terminal. Cancer was killing her. And you will die from this. And death was ready to take her away. Knowing that the Grim Reaper was standing at the foot of my bed. Watch as she enters the battle of her life. I simply had no options. With an undefeated champion by her side. I don't need my degree on my wall to see that this is a miracle. On today's 700 Club. Well, this is a shocker for you today. If you can believe it, three dozen House Democrats dropped a bomb. What is it? They want President Biden to renounce his sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. This action could take the same power away from future presidents. Can these Democrats pull it off this alarming move? And what does it mean? How come they're doing it? There's something behind it. What is it? John Jessup brings us this stunning development. That's right, Pat. Representative Jimmy Panetta of California wrote the letter calling on President Biden to give up sole authority to launch nuclear weapons. Panetta writing, vesting one person with this authority entails real risks. Past presidents have threatened to attack other countries with nuclear weapons or exhibited behavior that caused other officials to express concern about the president's judgment, end quote. About three dozen Democrats signed on to the letter. They want Biden to put in checks and balances in the nuclear command and control structure so no one person can launch a first strike. Among the recommendations requiring the vice president or House Speaker to agree with a launch order. Critics are concerned the changes would weaken the power of the presidency as it would apply to future presidents. This is about more than just one man. It is about the presidency. It is about the doctrine of peace through strength that we talk a lot about on this program. And I oppose this letter because I do believe that no matter who the president is, they have to be vested in the authority to be commander in chief, to take care of the country, even if it is Joe Biden during nap time. And Pat, so far, no reply from the White House on this proposal. Question that people are asking, of course, John Hannity did a big deal on it. But are these Democrats really saying that the president's mental capacity is such that it's so weak that they cannot trust him any longer with that awesome power? Is that what they're saying? And if it is, what's behind the thrust to invoke the 25th Amendment that takes the president out because of incapacity? Are they saying that or not? This letter doesn't say that. and so. You, if you watch the Fox like Sean Hannity, I mean, they're saying all over again that he lacks mental capacity. And these uh, 36, three dozen congressmen are saying we can't trust him with the nuclear football. Wow, this is a big deal. John. Pat, in other news, weeks after taking control of Congress, Democrats have started investigating the role of the media's reporting on the elections and the pandemic. Their target, right-leaning news channels like Fox News and Newsmax. CBN's George Thomas has more on the efforts to pressure TV providers to drop conservative outlets. Some say there's a war brewing against conservative media, while others argue it's just another example of Democrats trying to censor viewpoints or political speech they don't like or agree with. On Wednesday, the Democrat-led House Energy and Commerce Committee held a virtual hearing on, quote, disinformation and extremism in the media. When truth becomes a commodity to be traded upon for profit and facts and consequences don't matter to those who report them, our democracy is undermined. Before the hearing, Democrat representatives Jerry McNerney and Anna Eshoo of California wrote letters to TV providers, including Comcast, AT&T, Cox and Verizon, demanding to know how they planned to stop what they called the spread of dangerous misinformation from right-leaning news outlets like Newsmax, One America News Network and Fox News. Let me put it bluntly. Uh, misinformation is killing Americans and damaging our democracy. Democrats accuse the outlets of being a destabilizing threat to the country and functioning as rumor mills and conspiracy theory hotbeds with their coverage of the presidential election and the global pandemic. 
Republicans on the committee pushed back, calling the hearing an attack on the First Amendment. Elected officials using their platform to pressure private companies to censure media outlets they disagree with? That sounds like actions from the Chinese Communist Party, not duly elected representatives of the United States Congress. In their letter, Eshua and McNerney asked the TV providers to give their moral reasoning for allowing tens of millions to watch Fox News and other networks. They also asked if they'll continue hosting them, and if so, why? Jonathan Turley, professor at George Washington University Law School, was among those called to testify. From the perspectives of free speech and the free press, the letter is not just chilling, it's positively glacial. Dr. Frank Wright of D. James Kennedy Ministries knows what it's like to be on the receiving end of censorship. Earlier this month, the ministry's weekly Christian program was forced off Lifetime TV after it, it aired, among other things, a pro-life special. Like the, big... the ultimatum we received was basically, your programming going forward must have all non-controversial topics in order to continue to air on our network. You know, if you're a biblical Christian these days, there's not much in the culture that's not considered controversial. And the censorship is happening online as well with big tech companies. This past Sunday, Dr. Ryan Anderson's book, which challenges progressive ideas about gender, was pulled from Amazon's cyber shelves. We're going to have to think through how we as conservatives approach both the governmental side and the big business side, because both of them seem to be hostile to people with traditional American values. The House Energy and Commerce Committee will hear next month from the CEOs of Twitter, Facebook, and Google. George Thomas, CBN News. An investigation stirring a lot of reaction. Pat, back to you. Uh, it's just absolutely shocking. You know, the First Amendment is, it was Congress shall pass no uh, law respecting the establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise. All right. That is the government. There is a prohibition against the government. But if members of the government, namely House representatives, can send chilling letters out to members of the media saying, please uh, uh, explain why you are carrying these programs, that, uh, in a sense, is a violation, in my opinion, clear of the First Amendment. And the fact that these people would take it upon themselves to send a letter to a media, and if a media guy gets a letter like that, what's he going to do? You think, well, I'm just going to ignore it? Of course he's not, because these people have enormous power over them. There is a huge amount of money at stake, and there's all the freedom that goes along with uh, being uh, in a free society. But this, this is, Jonathan Turley said, it's not just chilling, it's glacial. It's unbelievable that this will happen. But folks, if you don't fight for your freedom, you will lose it. It's just that simple. And I think these members of Congress need to understand what's happening. And you need to, to let your voice be heard at the polls and at other places. And if anybody who is your representative pulls a stunt like this, they should be held accountable to the voters and in the strongest possible means. John. Pat, even before today's vote, Democratic House leaders are celebrating the expected passage of the Equality Act, the first step toward landmark LGBTQ legislation that critics say would crush religious liberty. But there is a potential alternative, and as CBN's Heather Sells reports, it's designed to protect people of faith. The Equality Act rewrites the 1964 Civil Rights Act to include sexual orientation and gender identity, but it also tramples on religious belief. The Equality Act isn't just neutral towards that, it's actually quite hostile towards religious freedom. Republican Congressman Chris Stewart is leading a bipartisan alternative called Fairness for All. Most of us are in, in a position in life now where we want to guarantee the civil liberties and the freedoms of all Americans, including LGBTQ Americans. It would protect gay and transgender people from employment and housing discrimination while also protecting people of faith. There's room here to find an area where both can be accommodated where both can be comfortable. The Equality Act doesn't do that. Fairness for all will. But many in the conservative movement, like the Heritage Foundation and the Family Research Council, 
argue fairness for all doesn't go far enough. What we need to do is we need to allow people to continue to live their lives according to their faith. And if someone is, if someone is deprived of their rights, then we, we, we deal with that. Southern Baptists call the religious protections insufficient and fear the bill will use the federal government to impose a new orthodoxy on matters of sexuality and gender across the entire country through the Civil Rights Act. Pro-life advocates note it could mandate taxpayer funding of elective abortion and violate health care provider conscience rights. The big question, will the Senate truly debate the Equality Act? Moderate Republican Susan Collins, an early sponsor, has pulled her support, and Mitt Romney also opposes, citing religious liberty. Still, there is much momentum for the LGBTQ measure, including powerful backing from President Biden. It's why fairness for all backers say conservatives should work with their bill, or risk passage of the Equality Act. Heather Sell, CBN News. Thanks, Heather. Pat, back to you. A few years ago, I wrote a book about what was going on, and uh, it was a bestseller. And I said, the time will come. Right now, uh, the, the idea of homosexual marriage is just unheard of. The idea of abortion on demand is just unheard of. Roe versus Wade was called Blackman's abortion. It was such a disaster, but it became law. But all these things were just, uh, I said it was on the fringe, and these people are, are not a part of the mainstream of America. But I said if they get power, what they're going to do is to impose their will upon the rest of us, and that's exactly what's happening. You're finding this homosexual activity, the, uh, Ill, and now they've got this transgender stuff where people who think, well, I want to be a, a woman instead of a man, and then suddenly you, you get uh, an operation and you, you now are switched, and then you, you make a decision later on, and little children at ages of four and five are saying, well, I, I want to be a girl instead of a boy. I want a boy, boy instead of a girl. It's just crazy what they're doing. They're violating the, the ordinance of God, but it's there. And instead of being a, a persecuted minority, in a sense, they have, and now the majority, are attempting to impose their will on everybody else. And if you don't comply, you're going to be breaking the law. And it's dangerous what's happening, but you keep your eyes open, ladies and gentlemen. It's happening very fast, and the left never sleeps. They never sleep. They're at, at this kind of agenda day after day after day. You can't think you've won one battle that you can go, go rest and get back to your church and get back to praising the Lord. It doesn't work that way. Eternal vigilance is the price of liberty. Okay, keep that in mind. Eternal vigilance. John. Pat, college students across the country will unite in prayer tonight. It's all part of the National Collegiate Day of Prayer. Our very own Regent University in Virginia Beach is hosting this year's event. Dr. Gerson Moreno-Riano says the goal is to unite in prayer for students, colleges and universities, and revival. Some of the greatest revivals in our country began in college campuses, and we think that uh, universities are just pivotal to the future of our country, and its students are pivotal, obviously. So we want to we wanna really pray for the Lord to do a great work in the hearts and minds of all of us and our students and faculty and staff throughout America. The prayer will be simulcast live tonight with various remote locations and Zoom rooms from across the nation. For more information, simply go to our website, cbnnews.com. Pat, it is a great thing to see young people praying, and if there's anything that we certainly need today, it's more prayer. As Gershon pointed out, some of the great revivals in history have begun on college campuses. Young people are seeking God, and we're seeing it at Regent. The, the, the intensity of, of spiritual life is at the highest level I can imagine. These young people are praying in their dorms. They're praying with each other. They're crying out to God for revival. Uh, and when the chapel was open, they used to fill the chapel up and were lying on the floor crying out to God. I mean, it was a beautiful thing to see. And God will hear the prayers of these young people. Terry. Well, up next, a discovery 2,000 years in the making. 
the place where men became kings and biblical prophecy is being fulfilled. Meet the team who's unearthing the original city of David. And then later, imagine trying to sleep with the grim reaper standing at the foot of your bed. That's what happened to this mother after being diagnosed with terminal cancer. So how did she cheat death? See for yourself, that's coming up. Hi, this is Pat Robertson. We don't know what the future holds for different tech companies, but we always want to be able to share the good news through the media. So I want to invite you to watch our program on cbnfamily.com or download the CBN Family app. This way you can have direct access to the 700 Club and other specials from CBN, and you won't miss a thing. Now just click below to get more details and watch with us. Tomorrow. I saw a sight that no mom ever wants to see. Their teenage son collapsed. He was starting to have a seizure in the locker room. His temperature, 107. His eyes were rolled back into his head and just moaning. His body was shutting down. That's what really got me. I was really scared. How this family fought for their child and won. You fight, Sam. Fight, fight, Sam. On tomorrow's 700 Club. Stay connected with CBN News all day across our platforms. Hidden for 2,000 years, the location of the city of David was shrouded in mystery. So how did the discovery of an ancient tunnel unlock the secret? And what other fascinating discoveries are unfolded as the rocks cry out? Chris Mitchell explains from Jerusalem. The whole city of David lay. So we're looking at the city of David from here. This all is the, the city down. of David. Yeah. So we have the palace area over there. Anarina Heyman serves as the outreach coordinator for the City of David. Welcome to the City of David. It's the home to the ancient biblical Jerusalem. And up till 150 years ago, everybody thought that the ancient biblical Jerusalem lies within the confines of the old city right behind you, within the walls there. So the question is, what happened 150 years ago? And where is the ancient biblical Jerusalem? She then helped answer that question by explaining how the city of David lay hidden for nearly 2,000 years until a British archaeologist began a discovery that continues to this day. Chris, we're standing at a magical place right now. This is the place when Charles Warren came through the fissure that he found. He saw something. And when Charles Warren saw this, he knew that he rediscovered the ancient biblical Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Was this the beginning, sort of, of the unveiling of the city of David in the modern time? Exactly, because now we're speaking of a 2,000-year period where nobody knew where the ancient city was. Most people thought when they, when they came that what they saw in the old city, that was ancient biblical Jerusalem. It's only when he found this that he discovered, but wait a minute, the ancient Jerusalem lies outside of what we call today the old mm. city. The discovery of this tunnel system known as Warren Shaft visually tells how King David captured the city and brings the Bible to life. When we saw this, we suddenly saw exactly how the picture came together. And many times when we do excavations, we also don't know what we're looking at. And then we have to go to the Bible and that starts explaining it. So it's the Bible and the excavations and the excavations of the Bible coming together, giving us the full picture of ancient Jerusalem. Further down, they found yeah. where men became we kings. Gather. Most of the kings of Israel was anointed where we're standing right now. We are standing at the place of anointing. And Isaiah says, you will draw forth the water with joy from the springs of salvation. In fact, the city of David echoes with the people of the Bible. Abram, when he met, met Melchizedek, but then we get to David, to Solomon, we get to Isaiah, when he was giving his prophecies on these very walls here. Jeremiah, afterwards, when he had to speak about the destruction that was looming over uh, Jerusalem. All those things happening exactly where we're standing right now. More than 10 years ago, archaeologists uncovered another biblical site, the Pool of Siloam, that was fed by the nearby Gihon Spring. It's the place where Jesus healed the blind man and also where the Jewish people would gather for the feasts of the Lord. Three times a year, 
all the men had to come to the mikveh in the pool and from there get ready to go to Temple Mount. And this is the walk, the final ascent that all the pilgrims can do again when they come to Jerusalem. Haman sees this final ascent as a merger between archaeology and prophecy. Something amazing is happening, Chris, because we said that we are now excavating this road. And again, prophecy is being fulfilled because it says in Isaiah, build up, build up the road, the highway. And it says, remove the stones for my people's return. One ongoing excavation is this tunnel leading from the Pool of Siloam to the Temple Mount. Haman says it reveals the past and opens a door to the future. One of the City of David's most ambitious projects is this excavation called the Givati, where the entire history of Jerusalem is being revealed as if the rocks are crying out. You can see exactly how she slowly disappeared from civilization because one city was built upon the other. And you could see how the city could have lost hope, thinking, who's ever going to discover me again? Until God says, but in a time of favor, nothing can stop it. And that's what we see in Kibati. Jerusalem is slowly being revealed. Haman sees prophecy unfolding. We're starting to see in the last decade the blueprint. She's starting to share what she looked like to us again. So you can see how prophecy is speeding up as we go. It says, Hitna arime afar kumi, shake off your dust. Arise, take your rightful place, Jerusalem. If you see the excavations here on a daily basis, you can see the buckets flying. You can see the dust literally flying about, how she is shaking off her dust. She considers her role in the city of David a privilege. I call myself the luckiest person in the world, the luckiest girl in the world, because I have the opportunity to take what we see here and tell the people about the city of David, about the ancient Jerusalem. And every person that is passionate about Jerusalem and serious about biblical prophecy needs to know this. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, the city of David, Jerusalem. Isn't that exciting? You know, the thing about archaeology is there's nothing that they have found in all of the research that has gone on that has in any way disproved the Bible. Every time it uh, affirms the biblical text as being authentic, it's just extraordinary. And so your faith rests on the Lord, but at the same time, his record is pretty good to, to use as a roadmap. Terry? Yeah, some of those prophetic yeah, it words is. are really astonishing. Yeah. It is. Well, CBN Films takes a deep dive into the city of David in its latest DVD. It's called Written in Stone, The House of David. And it explores the historical record of Israel's greatest king and his dynasty. You can get this amazing story for your gift of any dollar amount. All you have to do is call 1-800-700-7000, or you can go to CBN.com. You can also text King David, all one word, to 51555. And if you want to watch this DVD today, instant streaming is available in 4K on the CBN family app. Still ahead, a cancer patient's PET scan turns into a glory scan. Her oncologist calls her results a miracle. So what caused her complete healing? You'll find out right after this. A story has inspired the world for thousands of years. Well, some scholars doubted his very existence. We are sharing some light on the story of David and Goliath. This is ancient biblical Jerusalem. CBN Films presents Written in Stone, House of David. Extraordinary discoveries made headlines around the world. Written in Stone, House of David. Get your DVD copy for a gift of any dollar amount. Do you have questions about God? Call us. It's toll free. 1-800-700-7000 or check out this link. Her life flashing before her eyes and getting a glimpse of her own funeral? Terminal cancer stalked Abigail Holt Jennings every waking moment. You will die from this. That's what her doctor said. And how is Abigail still alive and cancer-free to tell her story? You're about to find out. I had those moments, waking up just in a cold sweat, 
knowing that the Grim Reaper was standing at the foot of my bed. Like, I have a right to be here. I took your dad out, took a grandparent. I never even knew my grandparents. I have a right. I'm here to get you too. All her life, Abigail Holt Jennings had braced herself for this moment, a battle with cancer. She'd watched her dad fight it for 10 years until he passed away when she was 16. Now 42 years old, she'd been diagnosed with an aggressive form of metastatic cancer. I think the Lord was preparing me, like, you're about to enter a battle, but I am with you. Less than a year earlier, she'd undergone a double mastectomy after learning she had stage three breast cancer. She thought she was in the clear, but six months later at a follow-up PET scan with her oncologist. He said, this is what I feared. It's moved into your lungs and you see these places? He's like, these are places I cannot get to. This is, this is terminal and you will die from this. The treatments he did offer were extreme and would only put off the inevitable. That is when that grim reaper, I could feel, I could feel that thing, that spirit of death and that spirit of fear walk in the room. And then I felt wonderful Jesus walk in the room as well. <laughs> and he said, but who do you say that I am? And it was in that moment that something rose up inside of me. And I remember answering him in my mind. This is gonna be a great line in my book one day. In other words, I know you're gonna heal me and I'm gonna write about this one day. Abigail declined the treatments and decided she would fight cancer taking a natural and dietary approach. And above all, praying and believing God for healing. As believers, there is a, a hope inside of us. And so now, did, did I just walk around like, oh, you know, I didn't know how God was gonna do it. But I knew my eyes were on him. Enlisting the prayers of her family and friends, Abigail, a single mom of two, talked openly with her children about her health. And I remember my little girl, Lily, came up to me with a magazine. And she opened the magazine and she loved American Girl dolls. They now have a, an American Girl doll with no hair. And she said, Mom, maybe I need to get this one this year in case you lose your hair. And I said, honey, you will not have to order that doll because mommy is not losing her hair. Three months later, another PET scan showed the cancer was spreading aggressively in her lymph nodes. Holding on to hope was becoming harder. I simply had no options. I was just getting more scared and more frustrated and would wake up with dreams, seeing like a movie screen, my funeral, then, a couple months after getting that news, Abigail went to the Dominican Republic to visit a friend, a doctor, and take time to rest and seek God. Abigail remembers showing her friend the PET scan results. The look on her face when she read that last one, and I had never seen her look like that. That did rattle me. All I know to do is seek God with all my heart. That's all I know to do. She would spend many hours that week in prayer, seeking God's will. Late one night, near the end of her visit. I got out there and I said, God, I need to know, am I going to die? What do you have to say about this? It was just me and God. That is when I felt Jesus walk in, if you will. And I felt his presence. He said, uh, Abigail, I came to have a conversation with you. I came to actually go on a walk. Abigail says she then saw a vision of herself with Jesus in Jerusalem. He walked her past the cross and into the tomb where he lay down. And he said, watch this. And he sat up and he said, Abigail, when I sat up, you sat up. And then he walked to the entrance of the tomb and I will never forget this as long as I live. He said, when I walked out of the tomb, did I have cancer in my lungs? I said, no, Jesus, you didn't. He said, so do you have to have cancer in your lungs? I said, no, Jesus, I don't. And in that moment, I knew I am cancer free. A few weeks after she came home, Abigail faced yet another PET scan. She says that morning, Jesus spoke to her again. Good morning. 
this is the glory scan. <laughs> and I went, I went in that tube, you know, I hate those things. And I just sang, not a fear, not nothing. Later that day, a nurse called with the results. And she goes, Abigail, I, I don't really know what to say, but uh, there's nothing here. Like, there's, there's nothing here. And I was like, I know, I know. And I was like, <laughs> At the follow-up appointment, her oncologist confirmed that Abigail was cancer-free. He goes, I don't need my degree on my wall to see that this is a miracle. That was 2017, and Abigail has been cancer-free ever since. To anyone who's fighting a battle, her message is clear. Keep your eyes on Jesus. He was trying to tell me, this doesn't have to do with you. I took care of sin at the cross. I took care of every disease. I took care of every sickness. He is entirely the healer, entirely. I love it. When I came out of the grave, did I have cancer? The answer is absolutely not. Does Jesus have cancer of the lungs? No, he doesn't. Does he have metabolic syndrome? No, he doesn't. That's beautiful. And on the cross, he took care of everything. And by his stripes, you are healed. Now, we're going to pray for you, and you, you can have the same thing that Abigail had, because the same Jesus who said, I don't have cancer, and when I came out of the tomb, you don't have cancer. Now, here's a report that came in. Jane, who lives in Mesa, Arizona, suffered from digestive problems. She had four enzyme pills before eating anything. And she was watching this program, and Terry said, someone has a digestive e issue. You can hardly eat anything without it coming back up, and you're going to feel warmth and so forth. And Jane said, that's me. And ever since that day, she's been, on, on, been able to eat without pills. And Jane in Mesa, Arizona, is rejoicing. Amen. <laughs> she should be. Of course yes, she that's should. great. Well, for several months, Karen, who lives in Birchville, Michigan, could find no relief. She had a chronic cough. While watching this program, she heard you, Pat, say somebody else has lung congestion, and that lung is almost like tuberculosis, but it's not TB. It's bad inflammation. It's not COVID. Right now, just cough. You are made whole. So by faith, Karen coughed, raised her hands, and received her healing. Her lungs cleared up. She hasn't coughed a bit since Marvelous. then. Marvelous. Mm -hmm. Folks, you know, God loves you, and God is able. And what, what Jesus said to Abigail a long time ago, when I came out of the grave, I didn't have cancer. I didn't have any disease because he is disease-free, and we are complete in him. So we want to pray for you right now. You have some other, uh, I no, guess I that's don't. it. We're, we're going to, Terry and I are going to join together. We're going to believe God for you. And I ask you at this point of time, receive what God's going to do. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Father. Terry, what, what do you have? Thank you, Jesus. Someone's suffering from mental confusion. I, I don't know how old you are. You, I don't know if you're attributing this to your age, but it has nothing to do with that. God is healing that for you right now. It is not any kind of long-term memory loss. God's just healing and putting all of that chemical chemistry in your brain back together. And you're going to find you can remember not just short-term things, but long-term things again. Uh Somebody, I believe the name's Michael. You, you've got uh, your the, the term is hardening of the arteries, but you, you've you've got you're blocking your arteries are blocked um, with uh, various types of problems. And right now, those arteries are going to be free, and you're going to have a burst of energy, and you, you can't believe in the name of Jesus. Touch him, Terry. Yeah, someone else. You've had a, a kind of an odd lisp all of your life, and it makes you self-conscious when you speak. It has something to do with the formation of your mouth and your tongue and your teeth, but God's healing all of that for you right now. You're actually going to feel it in your mouth as he adjusts that and just begin to speak. It's gone in Jesus' name. There's a woman, I believe the name is Veronica, and mm. you uh, have something that burned into your throat. You, 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 I don't know what caused it exactly, but that burning is there and your, your throat is scarred and hurting. And when you talk and when you swallow this, this thing, put your hand on your throat right now in the name of Jesus. Touch her. Mm -hmm. Someone else suffering from eczema. You've had this your whole life. 
Today is it's gone in Jesus' name. You're going to see your skin clear up. You will not even have scarring from it. Well, Father, we pray for all these people who are watching right now who are suffering. We pray that you will answer their prayers, that you will hear their cry. They're your people, Lord. And as you told this Abigail, you don't have any cancer, and by your stripes they are healed. In the name of Jesus, we declare the stripes of the healing is upon the people, and we believe the report of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, touch them, Lord. Amen. Amen. And amen. Mm -hmm. Terry. Well, still ahead, a teacher remembers a student who wasn't just trying to get good grades. He was trying to find a family. Hear an inspirational story that began in a classroom and ended in an adoption center. And then later, Pat gives his unfiltered take on the issues that matter most to you. Laura asks, Pat, do you believe the day of the Lord's coming is soon? Stay tuned. We've got your questions and some honest answers coming up. We want to hear your story. Send us a message or call us 1-800-700-7000. And welcome back to Washington for the CBN News Break. New satellite images reveal Israel is dramatically expanding its secretive nuclear facility at the center of its undeclared atomic weapons program. The photos show a construction site about the size of a soccer field next to Israel's nuclear research center. The facility is home to underground labs that reprocess nuclear material to weapons-grade plutonium. Experts estimate Israel has material for at least 80 atomic bombs. Well, Pastor John Baker, founder of the faith-based Celebrate Recovery Ministry, designed to help people break free from their hurts, habits, and hang-ups, has died. Celebrate Recovery is a Christ-centered 12-step program based out of Rick Warren's Saddleback Church. Mac Owen, the national director of the recovery ministry, wrote, John touched more people with the healing power and grace of Jesus Christ than anyone else I have ever known personally, and one of those lives was mine. You can find out more about this story and always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at cbnnews.com. Pat and Terry will be back right after this. Do you want to know more about having a relationship with God? Call us at 1-800-700-7000. Dr. Benny Berry is a teacher whose students love her. In fact, a few joked they wanted her to be their mother. But as she soon found out, one of her students wasn't kidding. Some days I felt upset, angry, lost. They've taken me from my safe place and placed me in a home with strangers. That, I mean, I didn't have any help or anyone to turn to or anything like that. Anthony was placed in foster care when he was six years old due to his birth mom's drug use while pregnant with his baby sister. He knew about God's love through his grandmother and tried to stay hopeful in a tough situation. I prayed sometimes when I was feeling down or, and then other days I questioned him, why am I here? Why, why can't I find anyone to love me? Why I can't I go back home? He lived in group homes for nine years, hoping to be adopted, yet afraid of being let down. I didn't get my hopes up for anything, basically, because I didn't want to get my hopes up too high and it not happen, because deep down I wanted it to work. I wanted to get out the system. I didn't want to deal with the bonds of being a ward of the state anymore. I just wanted to, you know, have a loving family, a forever home. At 15 years old and after a failed adoption, he began losing hope. He got in trouble at his high school and was sent to Pathways Alternative School, where he met Dr. Benny Berry, a teacher at the school. And he came there and he volunteered to say the pledge at the beginning of the day. He volunteered, he was in ROTC at his home campus. He volunteered to hang the flag. I was impressed. Uh, I felt like, oh, this kid is a leader. This kid is a leader. He's different from the rest. He's, he's, he has initiative. Benny was single and had no children of her own. In class, students joked that they loved Dr. Barry and wished she was their mom. Anthony jumped in and wasn't joking. 
the discussion went to families. And some of the kids are saying, well, I've been trying to get Miss Barry to take me home. And, and so Anthony said, oh, you can take me home for real. And I said, well, no, you have, you know, your parents are doing the best. Respect your parents the way you respect me and it will, you'll be okay. And he's like, no, really, I, I'm in foster care. And so uh, a couple of students and myself, we didn't know. And we kind of gasped, like, really, you're in foster care? I actually was like, yeah, you can adopt me. I mean, w will you, or have you thought about adoption or, you know? Then we got deeper into the conversation. And, and I said, well, if you're gonna be my kid, you know, if you was ever my kid, you have to be good. And he said, for how long? And I said, forever, God, what are you, what are you talking about? <laughs> so uh, he said, well, you can, you know, look me up. I'm, I'm, I can be adopted, you know, you can take me home. Anthony gave Benny his information and the adoption website. I had never planned on adopting uh, because I didn't know. I didn't know the process for adopting. Only thing I knew about adoption is what I've seen on like a Lifetime movie. I never really believed, I'll say in the first few days, that it was something that I could do. It came time for me to leave Pathways and I was like, don't you forget about me and she didn't forget. When it became more real, I had to. I had to pray about everything. Um, I asked God to order my steps, everything that I want to do. I was like, okay, Lord, show me that what I'm doing is not just raw emotion. It is what I really should do. So I felt like God was showing me, yes, this is what you need to do, step by step, ordering it, ordaining it. To Benny's amazement, there were no roadblocks to the application process, and soon they began a trial adoption period. Later that year, on National Adoption Day 2017, Benny officially adopted Anthony. I was very nervous. It was, you know, all the anxiety and the tension, like, this is really happening, today's the day. I actually, we both couldn't sleep the, the night before. We spent most of the time talking to each other. That was a very good bonding period. National Adoption Day was an emotional day. My name was put on his birth certificate. His name was officially changed. It became real on that day. Everything we had prayed for, every step that I had asked God to order, we're now at the end of the road. It's over, it is official. We are a family. Nobody can change it. You the trait that best defines this new family of two is gratitude for one another and to God who opened the door and their hearts. He's bringing us all the way. He's carrying us. Like he carried the cross, he's carrying us on his back. But I'm thankful for her just loving me and taking a 16 year old, well, 15 going on 16 year old boy into our home, a troubled boy at that. I love it. It's something that I never thought I would have. I'm happy. For someone my age to get adopted, it, you know, it's very rare. I didn't know that I could love somebody so much besides my parents. I needed him probably as much or more than he needed me. I don't tell him a lot because I don't, I don't want to think he has the upper hand. <laughs> but I am more than proud of him. I thank God for the opportunity to help mold somebody who I know is going to do wonderful things. What a great and inspiring story, isn't it? To know that you cannot even be looking for something and God speaks to your heart and you get to change a life. I mean, how amazing. And then the process, your life gets changed too. What a great decision. You know, there are almost a half a million children in the foster care system in the United States. Church, we could do something about that. Say yes. <laughs> well, Amen. <laughs> still ahead. It's part of the program that you've been waiting for. You always wait for it. It's your question and some honest answers. Anne writes, what if someone you consider to be a man or woman of God prophesies over you, but they get it wrong? Do you still let them prophesy over you? Well, Pat's going to tackle that and lots more. So stay with us. We'll be back.
This Easter, spend time reflecting on Jesus' final week. In CBN's free devotional, The Hope for Redemption, you'll follow his path to Jerusalem, observe his last Passover meal, gain insight to his agony at Gethsemane, witness his crucifixion, and encounter the empty tomb. This Easter, realize afresh that he is risen. Get your free copy today. Call 1-800-700-7000 or go to cbn.com slash Easter devotional. Krishna was behind on her bills. She also owed four months of rent. No one wanted to help Krishna, but, and she lost her will to survive. So how did Krishna find hope and help just in the nick of time? Take a look. Krishna lost her job due to COVID-19 lockdowns in India. As a single parent, it was hard for her to take care of her family, and she incurred a lot of debt. I owe my landlord four months rent, and I have to take care of electric bill and food expenses. Nobody wanted to help us. I had lost all my hope to survive. Krishna found hope when she was offered a job at an Operation Blessing mask making center. I am very happy that I found some help to earn money. Now I can take care of my children. We saw how hard Krishna worked to support her family, so Operation Blessing gave her her own sewing machine. Now I can work faster because this is a professional sewing machine with the latest technology. I'm able to make better designs and save a lot of time. It has helped me to increase my income. I have already paid back all the debts that I had acquired due to pandemic. Today, I'm confident that I can face any kind of problems in my life. May God bless those who had gifted the swing machine. Isn't it marvelous to give somebody hope, to give somebody said, I've got no hope. There's nothing going to happen. Nobody wants to help me. I'm going to die. And then suddenly somebody comes along and says, hey, Here's a little something for you, and we'll help you. And not, you know, it's a hand up, it's not a hand out. We want to help you find useful employment, and we'll do it for you. Isn't that great? Well, that's what you can do when you're a 700 Club member. We can't hear, help everybody. There are seven plus billion people in the world, and we can't help them all, but we can do it one at a time. And if all of us, all the Christians, would do just exactly that, a few, and before long, we wouldn't have any suffering and poverty of that level. It would be tremendous. So how can you help? Well, I want you to consider joining the 700 Club. What is it? It's $20 a month, 65 cents a day. That's all it is. And you can be a member of a growing army of hundreds of thousands of people that take it as their responsibility to change the world. So how do you join? Just call on the number right now. It's 1-800-700-7000. It's easy to remember, 1-800-7000, okay? And if you join, I want to give you something. Uh, this is my book. It's called I Walk with the Living God. This talks about victory over demonic power. It talks about starting enterprises. It talks about how you can have a better life. I mean, it's just a tremendous book. And in the book, there are all kinds of pictures. So there's a whole section of pictures of the early days of CBN and some of the people. And here I am with Billy Graham, and there's uh, Isaac Rabin and, and Archbishop McCarriott and Zhu Ranji, a whole lot of people. You'll, you'll really enjoy this book. Yes, ma'am. Well, here's someone who did. This is Connie. She lives in St. Louis, Michigan. Mm -hmm. She says, I was overwhelmed by the strength that Pat's portrayed through the years. It took me a day and a half to read I've Walked with the Living God. I couldn't put the book down. I would be happy to achieve portions of what Pat has done through his life. You well, have had quite the walk, it's, quite it's the journey. A, it's unbelievable the stuff that's happened over the years. but. At the end of the life, you begin to reflect on what you've done. Yes. And this for this book, this will bless you. And we're going to give it to you. You see, and you can get copies uh, in addition through Amazon or wherever books are sold. But we'll give you this when you join the 700 Club. 
1-800-700-7000. Okay. Absolutely. Okay, um, time for some questions. Time for questions. All right, let's go This for is Anne, who says, what if someone you consider to be a man or woman of God prophesies over you, but they get it wrong? Do you still let them prophesy over you? Uh, no. Uh, you know, I've had people do stuff that they thought they were talking from God, and they did no such thing. <laughs> John Wesley said, some woman came to him and said, the Lord told me, he said, you're bedding down with a whore. And he said, woman, God didn't send you. <laughs> Thank you very yeah, much. Yeah. Thank you, you know, anyway. <laughs> you're just lying. I mean, you know, you don't, you know, how do you tell a prophet if what the prophet says comes to pass? And if it doesn't come to pass, you're not uh, under any bondage to that person. You don't have to, somebody's prophesying. This is a control thing, uh, you know. A lot of people think they can control somebody else. But I have a word from the Lord for you. Baloney, okay? Okay, this is Natasha who says, I believe that every believer needs to tithe. But a friend of mine says, because we are saved by grace, tithing doesn't apply to us because it was mentioned in the Old Testament. Would you explain more on tithing for us saved by grace and why it's important? Well, uh, in a sense, your friend is partially right. Uh, we're not under any obligation, but you see the difference instead of a tithe, everything I have belongs to the Lord. I mean, all my possessions are His, and He lets me keep what He what I, I, I want. He wants me to keep, and the rest of it's His. <laughs> so, uh, they're, they're, in the Old Testament, actually, there were three tithes. I mean, it was up to 30 percent, and so it's, it's not just 10 percent. But that's like a claim of God on your on your income. And he said, bring your tithes and offerings if I won't bless you. And so it's a way of blessing. And so, but uh, we're not under obligation. But as I say, if I belong to the Lord, then everything of mine belongs to him too. Okay. This is Laura Pat who says, my question is about the day of the Lord's coming. Pat, do you believe that day is soon? Can you remind us what are the signs of his coming? Thank you. Love the 700. Well, I'm so glad. Well, the answer is I really believe that we're getting closer. He said, this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in all the world for a witness, and then the end will come. But he says there are going to be rumors of wars and wars and rumors of wars. There are going to be plagues. There are going to be famines. There are going to be pestilence. There will be a lot of bad things happening on the earth. Uh, but... Uh, I think Jerusalem, in a sense, is the key. And, and when the, the, the Jews begin to come back to the Lord, I think you'll see that as a great sign. But do I believe His coming? Yes, I do. I think it's coming closer. Okay, this is TB who says, as a Christian, knowing my loved one is in heaven, I have a hard time visiting their gravesite. In fact, I don't. My siblings are Christians too, and visiting our loved ones is important to them, so they visit often. They clean their gravesite and decorate for seasons and birthdays. I'm so confused. I feel bad, but it feels weird to me because they're in heaven. Am I wrong to feel this way? Well, no, you're not wrong. Your, your loved one is in heaven, and that, uh, you know, dust we are and dust we shall return. So there's a pile of bones that'll turn into dust and uh, your, your loved one isn't there, okay? This is Ernest who says, what's the difference between tithes and first fruits? I don't have a clear understanding. Well, in a agricultural society, you brought the first fruits. I mean, the first fruits of your, of your uh, harvest, the first fruits of your uh, f grain, first fruits, the, 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 the yeah, young of your right. stock and so forth. That was the first fruits. And, uh, you know, it, it, it can be part of the tithe, but, you know, uh, it, that's the difference. And I, I really believe that if you have a business, it, it doesn't hurt to say, I'm going to tithe the business or I'm going to bring, if I've got a special deal and uh, the, the first fruits of that is it's just what it says, the, the first fruits. We leave with today's Power Minute with Psalms. How good and pleasant it is when God's people live together in unity. Well, tomorrow, a mystery from the dismal swamp. Who was hidden there for years? Oh, boy, that'll be fun. You don't want to miss that. I'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.